Let's pray. Father, as we gather here today in your name, I pray that you will be with us, Lord. Will your spirit flood this place and rest upon this congregation, Lord. I pray that you bless this message that Anthony is about to bring us, Lord, and that your words, not his, will be spoken. I pray that your will will be done in this place today, Lord, and that our minds will be open and our ears will be attentive to what you have for us, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Hello. Am I, am I audible? Everyone hear me? There we are. Hi. There we are. Hello. Oh, I just, I just want to, before I even get into the intro bit I wrote, the last two songs, just hearing everybody, like, because sometimes during worship, like, sometimes it's like, oh, we're singing along with the tracks, and, like, it's hard to kind of tell if it's the music track, but I could just hear y'all singing out, praising and worshiping, and that was, that was cool. Holy, 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 apparently, that's, that's your guys' jam. <laughs> That is, that's where we're at. Anyways, hi, uh, my name's Anthony St. Ives. I'm the youth pastor here for any of the new faces we've been having kind of come, if you guys don't know who I am, uh, if you couldn't tell by the everything, I'm, how I'm dressed, uh, <laughs> jeans and a long sleeve t-shirt, there we go, I'm just missing the flannel, uh, but welcome back to another wonderful Sunday here at New Life. Uh, I'm filling in for Pastor Jason today as the taller, younger, and more handsome backup pastor, uh, <laughs> For those of you who weren't here a few weeks ago, Jason played a video about uh, loathing the backup pastor being on stage. Uh, and I said I would find a bumper video uh, for, you know, getting back at him. But as it turns out, I don't think many uh, people want to have a, make a backup video or a bumper video about their boss and making fun of him. <laughs> I don't have those same fears personally, <laughs> especially since he is not here this morning. Uh, <laughs> One day I hope to grow up and be a real pastor like Jason is. Uh, Jason asked me to speak today because uh, over the last two weeks he's done two sermons within, you know, roughly in that hour marker. So he asked me to come up here today to bring that average time way down. Uh, all right, so the real reason might be that he and Amy, along with Dan and Anna Leeser, are at Pastors and Wise Retreat down in Branson. Uh, I hope they've had the time to rest and relax and refresh and get back, ready to get back to work uh, after they're done. Also, some of you may be asking, Anthony, you're a pastor, and somehow you have a wife. <laughs> somehow, some way. <laughs> God is good all the time. Uh, <laughs> why didn't you go to Pastors and Wives Retreat? It's in the name. Pastors and Wives Retreat. Backup Pastor Wives Retreat is later in the year. <laughs> they treat us super well. They rent out the nicest lobby of the nearest Motel 6. And, <laughs> and we could have the free breakfast as long as we're there. Uh, but we, it's just like the last half hour. But it's super fun. Uh, all right, all jokes aside, I am glad to be back up here again. Uh, thank you for having me on this Sunday. Not that you had a choice, but thank you anyways. Uh, but before we get into today's message, just want to take a quick moment in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this space, this time, this place to gather, Lord. I pray as we go through this message that you have for them, Lord, today, that, as John said, uh, I not stand in the way, but I just be a vessel for what you have to communicate today, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Also, thank you, John, uh, for doing the pastoral prayer today in lieu of uh, Mr. Leeser being here. Uh, not to put him on the spot or brag about him or anything, but as his dad always constantly says, uh, he will be a pastor that's greater than both of us combined. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I just thank him for his willingness to step in and you know, fill that role for us. All right, so for today's message, I don't normally write uh, a sermon title. I know a lot of pastors do, but I typically don't do it because sermon titles normally are just kind of for internal use, so you just kind of remember what your sermon's about. Uh, but today, I did write a title of the message, and if uh, I was going to share it to you, I'd say the title is, You Cannot Be the Same. And for any of you who want to read along or kind of keep track of where we are, we're going to be in Luke 18 and 19 today. Don't worry, not the whole thing. Uh, at the core of this message is going to be the idea of change, which I would say change for a lot of people is a scary word. Uh, it's one of those things that we're not fond of, uh, whether it be... Uh, 
life change or some uh, small minor change or when people ask if you want change, uh, like, like you get two pennies back. It's like, no, you can keep that. Uh, but some of you also may be laughing at yourself because you know you're some of those people who are completely adverse to change. How many people 30 or 40 years ago drove a Chevy or a Ford truck and you are never going to own anything other than that brand for the rest of your life? There's some hands that are going up in honesty, and then there's a couple liars in the room. <laughs> uh, I'm going to pick on him in a little bit because he's in the crowd, and he took his chances to pick on me when I was a child, but my dad is very much not that person. He's owned every vehicle brand under the sun. <laughs> Whatever's cheap. I don't know. I don't know. I've seen your truck. <laughs> Maybe when we were younger and you were still feeding us, that was the case. Uh, but I've met people who would be happy to die and be buried in their truck because they love their truck so much. Now, if you drive a Chevy, that may be happen faster and on accident, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's besides the point. <laughs> and I don't want it to seem like, because I know I said 30 or 40 years ago, so it seems like I'm picking on kind of the older crowd. Uh, while that stereotype that older people may not change as much may be a little bit earned, if we can all be honest. Young people are just as equally guilty of this. Ask any person under the age of 40, hey, you own an iPhone, what would you think about switching to Android? <laughs> <laughs> or vice versa. People think the next civil war is going to be started over like politics. I'm convinced it'll be whichever one of those companies monopolizes the market and everyone else just rebels. <laughs> Uh, the only difference really between young people and older people being adverse to change is young people just seem to be more self-righteous about it. If you ask an older person, why do you like Chevy? I like Chevy. <laughs> why do you like, I you ask a young person, why do you like iPhone? Because it's a core part of who I am. <laughs> and the mere suggestion that you think I should step away from it means you're a bad person. That's the difference. <laughs> but these are some of the, just the simple things that we aren't willing to change. In reality, things like the car you drive or the phone you use are relatively unimportant. Your phone's gonna make phone calls and receive texts. Your car's gonna get you from point A to point B. And if honestly, if you know, push came to shove, most of us, even though we wouldn't like it, would be able and willing to change those things. But when it comes to much bigger things, how much do we as humans struggle with things like life change, starting a new job, starting a new relationship, moving to a new town, uh, starting a new diet, learning to change certain behaviors and attitudes, going on to try to change a mindset that we have. These bigger life changes are where we can start to see the, the stress of change show itself. I remember back in 2019, or as I refer to that year, the before times, uh, <laughs> when I was still looking for my first big boy ministry job, uh, in September of that year, I heard about this really cool church in central Missouri that was looking for a youth pastor. And then Carthage hired somebody, and so then I heard about another. <laughs> I'm kidding, Carthage wasn't hiring at that time. Uh, <laughs> but I had heard through essentially a friend of a friend of a friend that there was this church in central Missouri looking for a youth pastor, and he thought I should apply. So uh, I apply, they call me, and I do an over-the-phone interview with uh, Pastor Grant and Aaron Murphy. Uh, and then a week later, I'm asked to come in for an in-person interview to lead the Sunday school for the teens that next Sunday. Uh, I come do the interview. I think it goes pretty well. Uh, if those of you who remember Dylan, who was at this church for a little bit, that was being fostered under Aaron, uh, I, I walked out of that board meeting because he was here with Aaron that day, shooting just down there shooting hoops, and he heard me come out and he thought they were done. And then he said, so how do you think it went? I think Aaron's 12 at this point, 12 or 13. I said, I think it Dylan, sorry, Dylan, not Aaron. <laughs> uh, and he, said, he says, how'd it go? I said, I think it went pretty well. He's like, they'll probably hire you. They seem desperate. <laughs> <laughs> how right that boy was. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they have two other candidates they like to talk to first. I go back to Illinois to await their answer. At this time, uh, I was living in a hotel with a friend, which sounds bad, but it wasn't as bad as it sounds. It wasn't great. Uh, I was also working for Batteries Plus Bulbs full-time, making about $11.50 an hour, and then because it was retail and we got commission, but it wasn't great commission, like an extra like $30 a month in commission for sales. And so, you know, not killing it, but 
not doing the worst either. Especially for someone, though, who had their bachelor's degree and, at this point, my master's degree. Uh, while I don't think the status of those jobs necessarily determine like, who I am as a person or what I'm worth to a workforce, it didn't feel great to be earning that little. Uh, and not, also not saying that retail jobs are bad, but I had this call in my life, and I knew I was like, I'm going into youth ministry, I'm going into ministry. I tried to find a job at the end of senior year, it didn't happen. Graduate with a master's program, still hasn't happened. Like, come on, let this be something. Well, about two months goes by uh, because Pastor Grant and the board took their sweet time. Uh, all I'm saying is we hired Jason real fast. Uh, <laughs> but I get a call in November that they'd like to offer me the job. And then he says, on that call, I should take a few days to pray and think and get back to them. In that moment, I'm just elated. Finally, someone's fully offered me a job. Like, Thank God I've been waiting years for this to happen. Am I going to get the chance to have a youth group of my own? I'm going to be in a new church, in a new state. Everything is about to change. I got that call while I was at work. Uh, I took it because I recognized it as a Missouri zip code, and I was like, well, I only know two people in Missouri, and I don't think my cousin Linda Sue is calling me right now. And I, I run to the back room. I take the call. I get it, and I hang up. And I just hang up the phone immediately. I go, yes! Uh, <laughs> sorry, we record these and I don't want the audio to be that bad. Uh, <laughs> but I'm just excited. My coworkers are like, what happened? I was like, I got that job. And they're like, we're going to miss you, but that's so great. And I go back to the hotel room and I sleep great that night. Because I'm like, yes. Like, obviously, I'm just going to wake up tomorrow and I'm just going to call them. And the next day is when I kind of made a critical mistake. See, Grant had asked me to pray and think over the position and I had done the crucial mistake of overthinking it and not praying enough. I spent far too much time thinking. And the more and more I thought about the things in my life that were about to change, the more I felt the weight of that change coming. When I was living in a hotel and working at Batteries Plus Bulbs, I knew my situation wasn't ideal, but I had grown to be comfortable with it. Me and my roommate who were in that hotel at the time, because yes, I was living in a hotel with an, another person. Uh, Alex, he's great if you're watching this. Hey, Alex. Uh, <laughs> I knew where I was going to sleep. I knew what my days would look like. I knew what my schedule was. I knew how much I was going to earn at the end of the week. I knew all the things in my life to make things comfortable. And that's where a lot of resistance to change breaks down. For many of us, the devil we know is easier to deal with the things that we don't. Even if the situation isn't ideal or is even bad, people don't often seek change because on the other side is the unknown, and the unknown is uncontrollable, and therefore it's terrifying. For me, I had known that change was coming. I was like, I'm in ministry. Like this, I, I believe God's going to give me this position. He's going to do this work. I'm going to find somewhere to work and be able to do ministry. And I'm going to have these great opportunities. Like This is coming, and I know it. And that did not change the fact that once the change arrived, I froze. I knew the change was coming, but it didn't save me from overthinking it and terrifying myself a little bit with it. But what we are usually excited for is the thing that will result from the change rather than the process of change itself. We always think of change on what's on the other side of it. When me and Jason were doing the pastoral weight loss challenge last year, we were both excited to lose weight. And so we're like, yeah, this is going to be great. We're going to lose the weight. And then we started day one of the diet. We're like, ah, this is going to take a long time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to have to give up things we don't want to give up. And we're going to have to make big changes. And it's going to be for several months. And that was just a temporary change. I'm off that diet now. I'm actually about to start it again soon because I still need to lose a bit more weight. I know you may be looking at me thinking, no, you look in perfect shape. But trust me, it's <laughs> black shirts do you a lot of favors. That's all I'm saying. Uh, but this idea of being terrified but change is well exemplified in the story we're going to find in Luke 18 today. Starting at verse 18, we read about the interaction between Jesus and a young rich ruler. I'm not going to read the whole passage, but what we see is the ruler approached Jesus and asked, what do I need to do for eternal life? Which is, a lot about that question is telling, because it's not Lord, how do I need to change for me to seek salvation? Lord, what do I need to do? It's what do I need to do for eternal life? What is the next step? What's the next task? What's the next thing 
that will bring me eternal life, Lord. He comes to Jesus and is seeking the wisdom he needs for it. Lord, what do I need to be, do, or change in order to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus tells him in verse 20, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your mother and father. Hi, mom and dad. Uh, And the ruler says, dude, I've been doing this since I was a kid. Like, I've got all that nailed down. I got this, Jesus. Hit me with something else. Come on, I've been doing this my whole life, and you're telling me something has come and changed, and you're bringing something else. What is that? That's the RSV version. Don't look it up. Uh, And Jesus says, when he heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, which at that moment you have to think, the guy who was just so confident in all the things he had done, had to be a moment where his heart sank a little bit. Had to be a moment where he was like, Wait, what do you mean? I just, you just told me all the things, and I've, I've got them nailed down. What do you mean one thing I still lack? See all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. A.K.A., you need to give up relying on the financial status and the wealth you have relied on for so long, and you need to start relying on the Father, and you need to follow me in my ways. The rich ruler who approached Jesus, probably with a sense of excitement, says he left sad, for he was very wealthy. And he left sad because the cost of the change that Jesus was calling him to felt too great. Because when you're rich like that, especially in that day, and especially for how the ruler seems to act, that's what he was leaning on. His comfort was his wealth. His comfort and his peace was the fact he knew he'd always be able to provide for himself financially. But I'm not here to necessarily talk about financial wealth and gains and all that and to rip on the rich or anything like that. But what the point of that was is that the rich man was finding his self-worth, his comfort and his peace in something that wasn't God. By the time that story ends, we don't hear about anything give, or about him giving away any of his wealth, which would seem to suggest he doesn't. Because if there was a victory to be reported, you could probably assume that the disciples would have said something about it. They would have gone, and he went and gave away, and it was a beautiful, wonderful victory. But all we hear is he walked away sad, which means he felt convicted. He did, even just a little bit, but he did nothing. He was called to change, and he failed. Now, let's contrast that with the story we find in the very next chapter, starting in Luke 19, verse 1 through 4. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief, he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he was seeking Jesus, or he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree, for he was about to pass that way. So here is where we meet Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector, a group of people who I'm sure all of us love dearly. April 15th coming up, who's like a favorite national holiday? (laughs) Just me? Cool. Uh, Yeah, woos from the people who don't pay much. But not just any tax collector, he was a chief tax collector, which means he wasn't the guy going door to door saying, give me your taxes. He was the guy either having people under his servitude go do it, people he was hiring go do it. He wasn't going door to door collecting the taxes, but he was setting the precedent for tax collectors to go and collect. This also means he would have been the one in the area who had the power to scrape any extra money out of the tax collection for his own benefit. Which, as we'll read further down in the passage with something Zacchaeus says, heavily implies that's something he's done and he's been doing. Which the extra sting on top of that, is for, for a little more historical context, is the chief tax collector, that position, that governmental position, would have meant he would have been wealthy purely just by being the chief tax collector. He wouldn't have needed to scrape anything off the top. But Zacchaeus, for his life up to this point, had been controlled by the idea of obtaining wealth. And so making the people he was collecting taxes from pay... instead of 12% or 20% instead of 10%. I'm the chief tax collector. No one's got the authority to stop me except the Roman Empire and 
they're not going to do it. <laughs> as long as they get their money, they're leaving us alone. But here's where we start to see some key differences between the story of Zacchaeus and the ruler. So you see Zacchaeus have a sense of desperation. He's short. Like short, short. Like not to pick on her, but like Rita Bartel short. Uh, <laughs> like imagine a row of like me and Jason standing up front and then like Star is like, I want to see Jesus, but like we're in front, so that's not happening. <laughs> if he was short by that day standard, average height back then, 5'3 to like 5'5 five five for a male, it means he might have been sub five foot tall. He might have been 4'11, 4'10. He was short. And he's trying to see Jesus. He's actively trying to see Jesus to see who Jesus was. But there's a bunch of people in the way. And so as in desperation, he climbs a tree. Already we see a sense of desperation from Zacchaeus we do not see from the young rich ruler. The rich ruler is only said to have approached Jesus. He says, I'm just coming to ask a question. But Zacchaeus is actively and earnestly seeking Jesus. He humbles himself to climb a tree. And he's like, well, what is the act of humbling? Well, back then... Dignified government employees, essentially, wouldn't have felt the need to climb a tree just out of desperation to see Jesus. But Zacchaeus, also being a tax collector, wasn't necessarily well-liked back then either. So not a lot of people were going to be willing to stand aside and let him come on through. And so he humbles himself to be, able, to be willing to be humiliated by climbing the tree just to get a look at this guy because he knows something's up. He's willing to go to whatever length it took to see Jesus. However, in what way, we don't know exactly, but it would seem some way, somehow, a message or a word from God about Jesus or who he was, what he was doing, had gotten to Zacchaeus. And he had some understanding of what Jesus was, but he needed to know more. So as we continue on in this passage, in verse 5 we read, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down, received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Here's a great example where we see the heart of Jesus on display. As he's entering the city, a crowd is forming. All these people are gathering around him, waiting to see him. He looks up and sees one man who is just so desperate to see him, he's climbed a tree. And then he demands, hey, Zacchaeus, come down here. Come to me. I must stay at your house tonight. Which isn't just a weird request for now. <laughs> How would you feel if I'm up here? <laughs> I was just, you know, Steve, I'm staying over. <laughs> and you're going to feed me. <laughs> uh <laughs> I know they'd say yes, the Anwings are great people, but still a little demanding. <laughs> that would be more like a senior pastor God King kind of move, but you know, that's not how we do things here. We feed each other because we're Nazarenes. Uh, <laughs> but no, even knowing that Zacchaeus was a man who was considered a pariah amongst the Jewish community, Jesus knew Zacchaeus needed this moment, and so he calls to him anyways. And Jesus was also willing to be seen eating with a sinner. As we know, he's done many times to this point. He did not associate many with the Pharisees, but was willing to eat with those people considered less than or evil or dirty or unclean. We also see the general reaction of the crowd confirming kind of our suspicions that they were all grumbling that he was eating with Zacchaeus. Part of the grumbling was towards Jesus that he'd be willing to, but part of it was just, oh, Zacchaeus, the guy who steals all my money every month, every year. As we finish out this section, we read in verse 8, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. In a genuine act of repentance and recognition of who Jesus is, Zacchaeus relinquishes what he had held closest to himself for a long time. He offers half of all he has to the poor, and on top of that, not within the half I'm giving away, I'm going to give away the half to the poor, and if I have defrauded anybody, 
if I have taken extra of mine, what was not mine to take. I will reimburse that four times what I took. He is looking for repentance and justice for what he has done to the people around him and for the darkness that was in his own soul and the acts he's done against God. Jesus hearing this genuine act of faith on his part, or Jesus hears this genuine act of faith and recognizes that he is truly saved and is welcomed into the kingdom as Jesus' purpose on here was to save the lost. You are a true son of Abraham. Because back then they would have recognized people, those who had the salvation that was been saved would have been people descended from Abraham. And Jesus says, you too are a true son of Abraham. You have been saved today. When we truly encounter Jesus and have a heart after his own heart, as I suggested the title of the sermon was at the start, we cannot be the same. As we see in the story of Zacchaeus, we earnestly and desperately are to seek after him. And if we do that, there's a change that will be coming. Zacchaeus was comfortable. He had what he needed to survive. He had what he needed to be, quote unquote, but he would never be fulfilled. And though the teaching and interaction he had with Jesus, and through that interaction he had with Jesus, that there was more to life than what he was shown and what he was missing. He was saved. He went through a transformation. He was sanctified. He was changed from a man that he, that sought after, or he was changed from a man that sought only after earthly wealth and earthly possessions and earthly comfort to a man who earnestly knew what it meant to give sacrificially and what it means to have a heart after God. Because you're not going to be somebody who's in church every Sunday, but if you don't have a heart after our own God, just our heart after our own God is just willing to give away half of all you own and even more on top of that. That is a genuine change of the heart that stood before Jesus. When we compare this to the rich ruler from the chapter before, he was seeking to justify his place in kingdom purely with adherence to the law. Hold these commandments. I've held these commandments. But then Jesus asked for his faith, for his heart, and it was too much. What he was lacking was a heart that reflected the heart of the one who made him. His vast wealth gave him comfort and he leaned on that and relied for his peace. But the things of this world are temporary and will always eventually fail you. In my studying and research for this sermon today, I came across several articles that all kind of iterated the same thing, that when the fall of Jerusalem would have happened 30 or 40 years later from this interaction, the rich ruler probably lost all his wealth anyways. Because the things of this world are always temporary. Whether that be the world takes them from us, that life circumstances take them away from us, or just simply their time comes. And all we have or had or still have these things of this world, we try to keep for ourselves and negotiate with God on why we should be able to hold on to them. Who here has tried to strike a special deal with God about something? (laughs) And I don't mean like, praying for like, be like, hey God, I know you said this in the Bible, but what if it was just a little different for me? Let's negotiate here, God. I tithe. That's a little bit of a bargain. Let's talk. (laughs) But whether they be physical things like money, possessions, or people, or internal things like pride, anger, or ego, there are things we just try to hold on to because we have a sense of comfort in them, because in the comfort is the known, and in the known is control. But when we enter in this relationship with God, we are to lean on his grace, his love, and his power to sustain us. We have to be willing to let go of us and the control we want for this life in order to give it to him. We have to accept the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, which may take us places we never thought we would be. We might talk to people we never would have talked to. We might do things we never would have thought we were doing. If you had asked Zacchaeus a year or two before, he probably wouldn't say, you know what, I bet in a year, in my uh, two years from now, we'll be on my bingo card, giving away most of my stuff. 
Two years ago, I doubt that cross of Keys is mine. But because he knew something was different and because he responded to the call of Jesus, he was changed. And part of being changed is a response. Yes. You can't be changed and be the same. How angry would we all be if we took our car to a mechanic and we said, hey, the transmission's broken. And then we went to go pick it up and he said, I fixed the transmission and you went to try to shift it into gear and it still didn't work. And it's like, I thought you said you fixed it. Oh, that's the same transmission. But I said I changed it. So that's just as good. <laughs> Give me $7,000. <laughs> How angry would we be? We'd be furious. Because when we say we are going to change, something has to be different. The changes that we've experienced in our life when we've been called take us places we've never imagined. I know I've talked about it before, but I didn't think the young kid who was in Southern California, cursed like a sailor in high school and had a cynical view on the world would ever be a youth pastor in Central Missouri. <laughs> Neither did they. Uh, <laughs> they were hoping possibly for a more lucrative career. Uh, <laughs> They're just being good parents. I'm not <laughs> saying anything bad. They just cared. Uh, <laughs> so to summarize all I've said here, and as I'm closing for today, we cannot be the same. And for me, that statement breaks down in two parts, a little bit of a double entendre for that statement. And for those who have remember the uh, backup pastor sermon from a few weeks ago, I know you're thinking, wait, pastors break down in threes, but I am the backup pastor, so we only get two. Uh, <laughs> First is your life will not be the same. When you follow God's will for your life, expect the unexpected to happen. He is going to pull you out of your comfort zone. I'm not saying that 100% of you, 100% of you will have your life dramatically change and God calls you from being a teacher or a banker or a retail worker to go overseas and be a missionary in Africa. Or that he's going to look at you and say, I know you've amassed this great wealth and you've gotten to earn, you've gotten to enjoy this blessing for a long time, but I expect you to give 100% of, of, of it to the poor. But he might. The point of change isn't to be ready for the most dramatic, but the point of being ready with the change God has for you is to be ready for it. And not just be ready, but be willing. That's what it is to have a heart after God's own heart. It, what it means to be sanctified, entirely sanctified, is to have a will modeled after God's will for you. And no matter how scary or nerve-wracking that is, to follow through on it. Trusting that God will have you no matter what happens. Others might be serving in ministry you never, you never thought you were considered. Leading a small group, even though you never saw yourself doing that. Praying for strangers in a supermarket or a hospital, even though you wouldn't have done that before because you were afraid of the social consequences of looking like one of those Christians. Although... If we're afraid of looking like one of those Christians, I'd rather be as one of those Christians because those are the Christians who have a heart after God and are willing to pray in public and not afraid of public ridicule because that should never really model what we do here. When you enter a relationship with God, there will be old habits and things you have to let go of and there will be new ones you take on. While those might seem scary at first, I would remind you that we just read the two stories of men who heard the call to give up what they had. The one who held on only was told to experience sadness in the story, but the one who let go was the only one who was talked about experiencing joy. Second, and I already touched on, your heart cannot be the same. Zacchaeus did not give his wealth away after Jesus asked, or Jesus, all right, Zacchaeus did not give his wealth away after Jesus asked him to. He did so because it was his heart being modeled after God's heart. Because in the story, it doesn't, Jesus doesn't say, Zacchaeus, give away your wealth. And Zacchaeus did it in response to the change of who he was. He didn't have to be told, or he was told, but it was just a part of his heart. Jesus did not have to order him. Something the rich ruler lacked, thus his strength to go through with what Jesus directly asked him of did not happen. We cannot hope to do what God calls us to do in this life unless we learn, we learn to change from relying on our own internal self to being changed by him on the inside out. 
Otherwise, we will burn out and eventually crash under the weight of the pressure of the task he's given us. Because whether it be formal ministry like I do and Jason do here, or small group ministry, or helping out at a food shelter, or doing whatever it is in your life, what God calls you to, all of us are not built on our own to handle those tasks, but the rest is supposed to be us relying on God to give us the strength to do them. We have to pray and we have to seek God's reign at our, our very core of who we are. And it is with his grace and mercy we will find the power to follow through with what he has for us. A life lived in the, in the call God has placed upon us is the one that will result in great change within our life. At times of change may seem scary and cause us to fear. Let us rest in the knowledge that the one who holds the universe holds you now. And when, change, and when we change in accordance with his will for our lives, there's nothing that can hold us back. Right now, I'm taking a little break this week, obviously, but we are in a sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount, as Jason talked about the last two weeks, is a sermon, it is a message from Jesus about great change in how we are supposed to act towards one another. It was very countercultural to the ideals that people held at the time, and honestly, to the ideals people still hold now. And we're going to be in there for a long time and there will be a lot of change called for. And it's going to be nerve-wracking. It's going to be scary. But I urge you to seek it earnestly because if it's the change God has, it's a change that's always worth it. Join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, this chance to come before you, to worship you today, Lord, in wonderful music and to hear a message from you, God. I pray as you work on our hearts and on our souls and work to change us to fit your perfect and pleasing will, God. That we have a heart after you, God, and that while times may be scary or nerve-wracking, that we lean and trust on you, Lord. That no matter what, you are a God who holds the world and you work in the benefit of your people because what is impossible through others is possible through you, Lord. And Lord, as we transition into this time of communion, and we recognize a sacrifice that your son made for us. A sacrifice he did willingly and sacrificially because his heart was after your heart, Lord. We thank you for that sacrifice. And we pray as we go through this time of recognition for what you've done through us. We take that to heart and we know that at our core because you have come to save and seek the lost. And we thank you for that. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Once again, just all the voices coming forward. I love it. Never gets old. Well, thank you all for being here today. Just a reminder, downstairs, the wedding shower for is it Shane? <laughs> Shane uh, and Kaylin downstairs. Food is provided. If you didn't bring anything, don't worry about it. All are welcome to stay. Uh, also, just another reminder for next week, don't forget, daylight savings. We want to see you all here at the proper time. If you all come mid-service, we know what happened. Uh, <laughs> but thank you for being here today. And as Jason would say, may he bless you, may he keep you, may his face shine upon you. You are dismissed.